Good morning. My name is Jean Nagelkirk, and I'm the Vice Provost for Health at Grand Valley State University. On behalf of the Health Forum of West Michigan Partners, which includes Michigan State University College of Human Medicine, Grand Valley, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan, the Michigan Center for Clinical Improvement, and the Midwest Interprofessional Practice and Education Research Center, welcome to the final event for this academic year for the Health Forum of West Michigan series. Today's panelist presentation is entitled COVID-19 and Education Challenges and Adaptions. A year ago in March, many of us abruptly moved to remote work and most students transitioned to remote learning. For some students, this created issues related to limited access to technology and internet services, limited social interactions, and difficulty securing individualized educational services. Teachers quickly moved into their courses to remote learning, creating, again, unique challenges in developing online materials, creating robust virtual communications, and providing access to student support services. Individuals not only needed to adapt to an increased reliance on technology for learning, but for connecting safely to friends and many families experienced financial instability due to job loss, food insecurity, or the loss of a loved one or an illness of a loved one. While there have been many challenges in K-12 and post-secondary education during this pandemic, many individuals and organizations have created innovations in educational delivery, offered unique co-curricular experiences, safely opened campus housing, created testing programs, developed contact tracing teams, and provided access points for health service supports for campus communities. These bold new services and programming created even stronger community partnerships to continue to provide the highest quality education possible for our students. Many questions are now emerging about the long-term impacts of the pandemic on education. Has the pandemic changed the educational system and how we educate and engage students? Have students gained the competencies needed for strong educational progression? What type of educational programming and delivery will be offered this summer? How about the fall? Today, our expert panelists will discuss the impact COVID-19 has and will have on education, the challenges that were faced and the adaption made as well as the innovations and opportunities that have emerged. Before we begin our presentations, I'd like to thank Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan for their support of this event and the entire Health Forum series. And I'd like to thank Diane Dykstra for coordinating this event and making sure everything progresses smoothly. Now I have the privilege of introducing our moderator, Dr. Doug Vanderjack, who is the superintendent for Hudsonville Public Schools. He has served as a teacher in the East Grand Rapids public school system and as an administrator at Rockford Public Schools. Doug received his Bachelor of Science degree from Grand Valley State University, go Lakers, and his master's and doctoral degree from Western Michigan University. He has received many educational awards, held leader pos leadership positions on boards, and volunteers his time in the community. Doug? Thanks, Jean, and welcome everybody. Welcome to all our, our participants. I want to especially thank our panelists, our expert panelists, for spending some time with us this beautiful Friday morning. Um, today's format will be uh, a, a nice presentation from each panelist. Our first two panelists will spend about 10 or 12 minutes giving a presentation, uh, followed by a joint presentation by Presidents Mantella and President Pink. Um, they'll give about a 20, 25 minute presentation. I would encourage all the attendees, if you have questions, please use the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. When all the panelists are done with their presentations, we will bring them back um, and we'll go through the questions and answers near the end. So please, if you have questions, use the Q&A at the bottom and we will address those questions. If you have specific questions for one of the panelists, please make sure you note that in your Q&A. We'd like to start first with Elizabeth Hertel. So Elizabeth Thurtell is the director of the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Director Hertel joined the Michigan Department of Community Health in 2013 
as a senior assistant for policy and planning. And in February, 2014 was appointed director of policy and planning. Following the merger of the departments of community health and community services into the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services in 2015, Hertel served as Senior Deputy Director for Policy, Planning, and Legislative Services. In October 2016, she joined Trinity Health serving as the Director of Michigan Advocacy. In 2019, she returned to MDHHS in the role of Chief Deputy of Administration. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, for spending time with us. I will turn it over to you. Good morning. Uh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with you today uh, to discuss some of the actions that the Department of Health and Human Services and the state of Michigan have taken from a health perspective that prompted changes in the way education was delivered uh, over the last 12 months. And also, I'm not sure uh, if it was mentioned, but I'm pleased to be here at my alma mater as well, where I received my bachelor's degree uh, from Grand Valley a number of years ago. Next slide. We, we know this year hasn't been easy, and we are so grateful to our partners in education, teachers uh, at the K-12 level, faculty at colleges and universities, all of the support staff, students, administrators, and the parents and caregivers across the state. You've handled uh, these changes with grace and creativity, and we thank you for your work and your input. COVID-19 is a novel virus, and that means that there was a lot that experts didn't know, but that we have learned over the past year. Initial data led to Governor Whitmer issuing an order to close schools to do what we believed was necessary to save lives and slow the spread of the virus. But by fall, we were able to take a closer look at the latest information about transmission and guidance from the CDC to build our own state guidance and give schools flexibility to develop learning plans, including full distance learning and hybrid in-person models. Campus residential facilities present challenges unlike those in K-12 schools, as you know. MDHHS also worked with our colleges and universities to offer guidance and support that allowed institutions to plan for athletic programs and testing, housing and isolation options, and to adjust other learning options. As outbreaks continue to grow in a variety of settings and cases, hospitalizations and deaths surged again in late fall and across the country, in Michigan and across the country, and the decision was made to pause in-person learning. However, thankfully, cases continue to fall at the end of the year and the first part of 2021. Next slide. Before I continue on this slide, I do just want to let you know that my son is uh, getting ready to go to in-person school this morning. They started this week. So if you hear some background noise, he's getting ready to leave the house. What we've also learned through all of this, and I think we knew before, schools are essential. They're essential for our students, they're essential for our families, and they're essential for our economy. We all want to return to normal by doing what is best for students, educators, and parents. As Michigan continued to trend in the right direction, we saw information about lower risk in classroom settings. Governor Whitmer and our department encouraged schools to make plans for in-person uh, or hybrid options, particularly for our youngest children to begin by March 1st this week. Schools not only cultivate academic achievement, but they also provide critical social emotional skills that are foundational to a child's development. And these skills are difficult to practice from home without in-person interaction with their peers. Despite tireless work by teachers to adapt, and I can attest to that, some students have still struggled to succeed with distance learning, and the students facing the greatest challenges are disproportionately those who already face the most obstacles. This includes gaps in health, meals, and we saw a decline in immunizations. This pandemic has been traumatizing, especially for children. Their lives were abruptly dis disrupted that last March and their mental and physical health has suffered. Anxiety and depression rates are up, childhood immunization rates are down. 
Schools often provide a first opportunity to receive a vision and hearing screening to quickly address some of the most basic barriers to learning. School staff are the ones best equipped to detect and address child abuse and neglect and are often our first line of defense to protect the welfare of children. In the spring, countless school employees and community members stepped up to help deliver nutritious meals for low-income families. They also purchased and deployed laptops, tablets, and internet hotspots so that children could learn from home. These efforts are incredible. They made a huge difference, but they're not sustainable for us in the long term. Our schools are best equipped with the infrastructure necessary to deliver these essential services. This pandemic has also clearly widened the equity gaps that we have worked to narrow. Some groups of students need in-person learning opportunities more than others, and we should work collectively to ensure that these students have the opportunity to come back to school. Economically disadvantaged students, students with special education needs, young children, students who are English language learners, and homeless students. Some families will still choose for their children to continue learning remotely, and some educators meet the CDC definition of high risk. Likewise, some educators are particularly medically vulnerable, and schools should find ways to allow them to continue to teach from a distance. However, when possible, we also know that in-person learning provides a key benefit for many parents or caregivers who rely on children being in school to be able to participate fully in the economy. And there are many studies that show women have been disproportionately impacted. While some found caregivers for their children, these caregivers may be unable to provide the academic or technological support that many students need. School buildings are the best places for children to be while parents are at work. And this is especially true for essential workers that are on our front lines each and every day. So schools were strongly encouraged to provide as much in-person learning as feasible, especially for young learners, economically disadvantaged learners and learners with special education needs. Next slide. Again, this is a novel virus. In the early days of the pandemic, we knew very little about COVID-19 and how it was spreading. Over the last nine months, medical experts and epidemiologists have closely followed the data and have learned that schools can establish a low risk of transmission by ensuring that everyone is wearing a mask and adopting careful infection prevention protocols. So we shifted thinking to how can we re-engage safely knowing what we know now about the virus and its transmission. We've paid close attention to the evolving scientific research and adjusted our orders and guidance. It is becoming increasingly clear based on research done across the country and across the world that schools can be lower risk environments for students and staff when they implement these strict infection control measures. With knowledge on how to prevent transmission, schools can minimize risk and offer in-person learning opportunities for students particularly those for students in earlier grades. We recognize that schools may still need to close if they're experiencing an uncontrolled outbreak or if they are unable to operate due to uh, quarantining staff. And if cases again rise, schools may be subject to closure orders from state or local health departments. But we feel like we are heading in the right direction and we may not have to have that conversation. Unless subject to a closure order, school reopening and closing decisions will ultimately be made by the local school districts. However, studies of schools that are open in the United States and around the world have demonstrated that younger children are not a major source of transmission, either to their peers or to adults. Also, attending school in person has not shown to be correlated with diagnosis of COVID-19. According to a study published by the CDC among children in Mississippi, gatherings with persons outside the household and lack of consistent mask use were associated with COVID-19 infection, whereas attending school or childcare was not associated with positive test results. And in Michigan, we've seen few large outbreaks in our schools and very little evidence of outbreaks due to classroom learning. Universal mask wearing in schools is an indispensable mitigation strategy. Last summer, some people doubted the feasibility of young children wearing a facial covering all day in a classroom. But it turns out 
students have done a great job complying with the mask mandate, reducing classroom density, increasing spacing between desks, improving ventilation, washing hands, testing, and screening for symptoms all help reduce risk. And I would like to recognize the creativity of many of our teachers and our child care workers who have been able to take uh, mask wearing and incorporate that into their daily teaching as part of art projects and other activities that have really uh, made students committed to those masks and wearing those masks. And I've seen that personally. Next slide. The state of Michigan is committed to doing everything it can to help support students and educators return to an in-person environment. And we issued guidance that will help schools, not only K-12, but hopefully also serve as part of a conversation we'll continue to have with colleges and universities as vaccinations increase and more locations look to safely return to greater normalcy. This guidance focused on testing, vaccinations, using available federal funding and implementing safety protocols. Next slide. First, testing in schools. Testing is not a requirement for schools to return to in-person learning. Schools that follow existing guidance carefully and diligently are not considered major risk for outbreaks. Testing to diagnose COVID-19 is part of our comprehensive strategy and may be used in conjunction with promoting behaviors that reduce spread, like social distancing and mask use, maintaining healthy environments, and managing school operations. The state has worked with the high school sports association to pilot a testing program in 200 state high schools. And now that feasibility has been assessed, the state has rolled out a voluntary program to offer weekly testing to educators in public schools. Additional pilot programs may also be offered to school districts that are interested in a limited amount of student testing for the purposes of surveillance. It is important to remember that testing in schools is not a replacement for mitigation practices, including use of masks and social distancing. But if your school is interested in assistance with testing through our voluntary program, there is a form on our website, michigan.gov coronavirus. Uh, you can find it in the K-12 opening guidance sec section, uh, which I'll show you in a couple minutes. Next slide. Second, vaccinations. The Michigan Department of Health and Human Services released a prioritization plan for our COVID-19 vaccination strategy. We are following the CDC recommendations for prioritization of distribution and administration of COVID-19 vaccines for adults. CDC recommendations are, recommendations are based on input from the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, generally known as ACIP. This advisory committee is made up of medical and public health experts who develop these recommendations on the use of vaccines in the country. Teachers and other school staff are classified as frontline essential workers under our guidance and are now eligible to receive vaccinations. School districts have worked with state and local partners to arrange vaccination opportunities for school staff. Again, vaccination is not a requirement for schools to return to in-person learning, but we know that the demand is high. Next slide. Third, our federal funding opportunities. In December of last year, Congress passed a bipartisan COVID-19 relief package that provided widespread economic aid, including significant financial support for schools. Our K-12 schools are expected to receive more than $1 billion, largely allocated through a formula driven by Title I. This is more than four times the amount allocated to schools from our, the original CARES Act. And our partners at the Department of Education are working to help schools understand how to draw down those funds. Next slide. Schools should designate a staff person, such as the school nurse, to be responsible for responding to COVID-19 concerns. And all school staff and families should know who, the, who this person is and how to contact them. If feasible, schools should divide students and teachers into distinct groups that stay together throughout an entire day during in-person instruction and outside of in-person instruction. Recommend that schools limit mixing between groups such that there is minimal or no interaction between cohorts. 
Face masks must always be worn indoors by all staff and students age five or older, except for meals and in other limited circumstances. Plastic face shields or eye protection may be used in addition, in addition to cloth face masks for additional risk mitigation. However, our public health experts will say this is not a replacement for a face covering. We ask that uh, adequate supplies are provided to support hand hygiene, including soap, hand sanitizer, uh, paper towels, tissues, and signs, helping to reinforce proper hand washing techniques. And that students and staff maintain a six, maintain six feet of dis distance at all times. In instructional, instructional settings, space desks six feet apart, making creative use of all school spaces, such as gymnasiums, cafeterias, and other multi-purpose rooms. And if physical distancing of six feet cannot be maintained, uh, schools should consider alternative strategies to reduce that student density. <clears throat> and this may include the use of a hybrid schedule that allows students to maintain six feet of distancing and attend in person. There are still challenges. Our guidance also outlines a few other alternatives. We also recommend increasing ventilation and the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy has a great program to assist public schools by providing recommendations to reduce infectious aerosol transmission via the heating, ventilation and air conditioning system. This program uh, surveys schools to gather information on their HVAC systems. On completing a survey, K-12 schools are eligible to request an on-site inspection from a licensed HVAC contractor. And then implementing protocols such for staff and student screenings for symptoms associated with COVID-19 at home prior to coming to school. Every school was also asked to think about, identify and designate a quarantine area and a staff person to care for students who may become ill at school. And of course, symptomatic individuals should absolutely not attend school until they have tested negative on a PCR test or have completely recovered. Right now, we suggest 10 days after being recovered. Next slide. That's a lot of information, but we've tried to make it easier for you by creating an online toolkit with all of these resources, guides and FAQs as well as information about uh, any upcoming educational ses sessions on our website. Again, michigan.gov slash coronavirus. I encourage everyone to go there and visit and read through our opening guidance section. And we do also expect to have additional resources for colleges and universities soon. Thank you for this time. I look forward to the other presentations and addressing any questions you may have at the end of this session. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. A lot of information. I will tell you, uh, not to say you didn't smile the whole time, but when you said your son was off to school, you had a little smile on your face thinking you were, that's a good thing. So it's been a great week. <laughs> that's good to hear. That's great to hear. Well, thank you very much. Some great questions coming in. We'll address those at the end. Uh, once we hear from the rest of our expert panelists, I would like to next introduce uh, Sheila Ellis. Uh, Sheila serves as the Chief Deputy Superintendent for the Michigan Department of Education. She joined the department four years ago, bringing with her 42 years of experience working in education. During her tenure at the department, she also served as the Interim State Superintendent. She is the first and only woman to serve in the role of State Superintendent. And I can tell you she did an amazing job. Uh, she has been a teacher, a curriculum director, a principal, and the director of elementary programs and academic services, as well as a chief academic officer. Sheila, thanks for spending time with us. The floor is yours. Thank, thank you, Doug, and good morning, everyone. I'd like to thank Grand Valley State University for the opportunity to speak with you today. It's my understanding that most of you who are joining us today are either healthcare professionals or are working in the healthcare industry. Um, so I would like to say on behalf of State Superintendent Dr. Michael Rice, the State Board of Education, um, the members of the Michigan Department of Education, thank you. Thank you for the sacrifices that you and your families make every day, especially during the pandemic. Your dedication, commitment, and courage to keep our schools and communities safe deserve our deepest gratitude and our admiration. 
My presentation this morning has two parts to it, where we are today and where we need to go. So where are we today? Well, as you well know, it's been a really rough year in so many, many ways across our state, our country and our world. To assist during this pandemic, the Michigan Department of Education has partnered with the governor, legislature and countless organizations to provide leadership and guidance to schools and parents so that they're better able to navigate this. This guidance includes more than 160 memos and guidance documents on topics such as feeding our children while out of, out of school, supporting early childhood programming, learning at a distance, social and emotional learning, child care, and helping to close the digital divide, among many others that you see on this slide. Since the sudden closure of in-person instruction in schools across Michigan last year on March 13th, almost one year ago, educators across the state have continued to work diligently to ensure that our 1.5 million students continue to have the opportunity to learn, whether that opportunity is provided remotely, in person, or through a hybrid approach. During the last several weeks, several factors have led to an increase in the percentage of districts offering the option of in-person instruction. They include flattening the case growth rate, the availability of antigen tests for school staff, the beginning of vaccinations, the belief that our mitigation efforts when followed are effective, and the governor's encouragement that districts offer the option of in-person instruction on or before March 1st. As a result of these factors, the percentage of districts offering the option of in-person instruction in February increased to 65%, with another 18% offering a hybrid approach and only about 15% remaining remote. So in other words, 83% of districts were offering some option of in-person instruction last month. In opening up every district, we really have to be vigilant about our mitigation efforts. Mask wearing, social distancing to the extent possible, hand washing, disinfecting, ensuring effective airflow quality, flushing water systems, and screening, testing, and quarantining. MDE expects and is strongly encouraging districts to work with their communities and their health, local health departments to provide an in person option if they have not done so by this past Monday, March 1st, because we know that in-person instruction for most children is superior to in, in education at a distance. The governor indicated during her press conference last week that 97% of traditional school districts have committed to providing in-person instruction by March 1st. This is very important for all students and even more important for our most vulnerable students such as children with profound special needs, children who struggle to learn to read and beginning English language learners. So now moving to where do we need to go from here? In the midst of a pandemic, many people want one thing, a return to normal. Well, who can blame them? Most of us want a return to normal and a return to all school buildings being open and full of children. We realize now more than ever the power of in-person instruction. MDE wants all schools open, not most, as we currently have. Yet a return to pre-pandemic education is not enough. As districts begin to plan for next school year, which is what we typically do around this time of year, Dr. Rice is asking them to pivot to a new, better normal, not simply back to where districts were pre-pandemic. We need to aspire to this higher goal for two reasons. Many of our children haven't learned as much as they should have in the last year and educators are working really hard to catch them up to where they need to be. And our schools were improving in the years before the pandemic with an understanding that we still had a long ways to go. So as we aspire to these higher goals, we also need to be guided by what we knew before the pandemic and what the pandemic has taught us. We need to draw from pre-pandemic lessons and also to learn from the lessons derived from or made clearer during the pandemic. And let me share six of these lessons with you. Number one, time. 
Children have lost it during the pandemic and they need more of it next school year. Given the pandemic, whether students were educated primarily at a distance or largely in person, most stu students will need, most students will receive less instruction from March of last year through the end of this school year than any similar period in their education. The current minimum number of school days, 180, was too low before the pandemic, and it isn't close to that of high performing nations. Students and staff need more days coming out of the pandemic. We recommend raising the minimum number of school days for the 2021-22 school year to underscore the need for more time. And that's just the beginning. There needs to be a layering of additional time. As districts prepare for next school year, they need to consider whether all of their students or especially vulnerable groups of students, including children with profound special needs, beginning English learners, and our young learners who are struggling to learn to read, among others, need more time. And if so, how much more time? Some districts will need to add additional time above the state minimum for all of their students, some will need to add time for particular groups of students or for particular students, and some will need to do all three. Number two, home technology. It can be very helpful. We have learned during the pandemic that home technology can be a terrific support for most children. It, however, should not be a substitute for in-person instruction and the primary means for education. We should continue to narrow and ultimately close the digital divide in our state and, and our nation, not as a substitute for, but as a supplement to public education. Number three, partnerships. Many public school partners have stepped up during the pandemic, such as food banks, childcare providers, local health departments, libraries, and other youth serving organizations. Their support of our children and partnership will be even more critical as we work to seek to provide our children with wraparound services post pandemic that extend beyond the school day and the school year. While met mentioning partnerships, I'd like to express my appreciation to the Department um, of the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services for their extraordinary efforts partnering with the Michigan Department of Education to guide our schools, our educators and our families through the pandemic. We greatly appreciate um, your assistance and your partnership. I'd also like to recognize both the higher education and the community college communities for their continued collaboration with our schools and offering students early middle college and dual enrollment opportunities. These programs are helping to build the next generation of health professionals. Number four, social emotional learning and children's mental health. Children's social and emotional needs so evident to many of us pre-pandemic have received additional attention during the pandemic. MDE has begun a social and emotional learning children's mental health network and allocated more than $7 million from its education equity fund to local districts to support children's mental health. Governor Whitmer and the state legislator alloc legislature allocated a similar amount for related services. And local school districts have engaged in social emotional learning work this year more than ever before. We need to broaden and deepen our social emotional learning professional development efforts for educators in the coming year. And we also need to increase the number of social workers, counselors, nurses, and school psychologists to serve children properly. Number five, literacy. Where possible, we need to lower our class sizes at the early elementary level, where educators are laying the literacy and math skill foundation that will be necessary for success as students continue in school. Nothing is more critical to the success of young people in school than literacy skills. We can continue to improve educator knowledge and the use of Michigan's essential practices for literacy, literacy instruction as a means of improving our students' technical knowledge of reading and writing. Additionally, we need to increase student engagement in reading by selecting and sharing more diverse literature representative of who our children are and by extension, who we are as a state and a nation. And number six, school funding. School funding is another critical issue. 
Six studies in six years have said the same thing. We underfund Michigan public education to the detriment of our children. The most comprehensive of the six studies, the 2018 School Finance Research Collaborative Study, underscored the important theme supported by decades of research and federal law. Different children have different needs. Different needs have different costs. To fully fund Michigan's 1.5 million school children, according to the School Finance Research Collaborative Study, more than $3 billion in additional funding is required annually. The recent Federal Coronavirus Release Act, Relief Act will help districts across the state and country with non-recurring funds. They will permit many children to in many districts to benefit from improved services next year. While beneficial, there are limitations to these funds, including, but not confined to, their one-time nature. Two major efforts are underway to assist schools in planning for the 2021-22 school year. One of these is Governor Whitmer's Student Recovery Advisory Council. The council is comprised of parents, students, school leaders, educators, individuals with expertise in public health, pediatrics, and mental health, along with community members. The council is charged with developing and recommending to the governor, state superintendent, and state budget director actions, tools, and resources needed to get students back on track academically, physically, and emotionally. The second major effort is State Superintendent Dr. Michael Rice's new Better Normal work groups. These work groups are comprised of educators who meet with Dr. Rice to discuss how staff at the Michigan Department of Education can help their districts improve the education of the 1.5 million students in the state as they plan for the 2021-22 school year. So what does each district need? What does each child need? How do we provide it as we prepare for next school year? It can't simply be a return to normal. It needs to be a pivot to a new, better normal at the state and national levels in education because our children deserve more and better. Thank you for the opportunity to address you this morning. I look forward to hearing the other presenters this morning and responding to your questions. Thank you very much, Sheila. Appreciate your uh, your commitment to the, the kids and uh, definitely the kids in Michigan and the work you're doing at the Michigan Department of Ed. It is appreciated from the local level, I will tell you that. I'd like to now introduce uh, Philomena Mantella, president of Grand Valley State University, go Lakers, and Bill Pink, president of Grand Rapids Community College, go Raiders. Uh, Dr. Mantella is the fifth and first woman president of Grand Valley State University and began her tenure at the university in 2019. She brings more than three decades of higher education experience to her role. Dr. Mantella is entrepreneurial, strategically designing partnerships to improve pathways for diverse learners across their lifetimes. Collaborations across unique sectors mark her leadership style and her vision for education and the role it plays in the health of communities. Dr. Pink became the 10th president of Grand Rapids Community College in May 2017 and is the first African American appointed to the post in the institution's 100 plus years. With more than 25 years as an educator and a leader at the national and local level, Dr. Pink is focused on building on GRCC's strong history of service to all students guiding the college to be relevant and responsive to its community. Dr. Pink serves on numerous boards, committees, and educational commissions. Thank you both for joining us today. I will turn it over to the two of you and looking forward to some questions and answers following this next presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Good morning to everyone and happy Friday. Uh, it's good to uh, an honor to be a part of this conversation. Uh, honored to have our other presenters and have list, having listened to uh, both uh, both before uh, this presentation. And uh, while uh, you could probably you could say that some of the information uh, has some sobering effect, there's other pieces of that information that I just heard that I think is encouraging um, and and shows us that sooner or late sooner you know hopefully sooner rather than later that we will actually uh, see ourselves digging further and further. 
uh, out of uh, this uh, pandemic effect that has been the last 12 months. Um, I am honored as always, um, and I know that Dr. Mantella, uh, and you guys will have to forgive me, uh, we're, we call each other Philly and Bill, so um, uh, I know that uh, how honored it has been to, um, my goodness, Philly, probably in the last six months we have uh, been together on panels and discussions like this for, uh, I, I, can't, uh, I can't remember the number of times um, that we've both uh, been, uh, that I've been honored to serve on panels with you. And uh, I think it not only, I think the thing it shows to me is just, uh, uh, it, to me it rim, rings of the partnership that our institutions have with each other, but the partnership and the friendship that you and I have and uh, both of those things mean a lot to me. So it's an honor to be able to serve on this this morning. Um, you, we'll just let you know uh, these next uh, several minutes that uh, Philly and I are just going to kind of bounce off each other in terms of uh, some of the data and information that you'll see on these slides this morning. And we'll both speak to uh, what uh, the, our, uh, the climate looks like, the culture um, of higher education as we have seen these last, um, these last, uh, my goodness, these last 11, 12 months. And we're, we'll bounce off each other and talk about some of these things, but you'll see some information uh, on the slides that we will uh, use as a uh, basis for our comments this morning. So uh, I'm taking too long. I'm gonna go ahead and ask uh, Philly to jump in on this, uh, on our first uh, slide and uh, we'll get up and running. So Philly, it's an honor to be with you this morning. Thanks, thanks, Bill. And it's always an honor to uh, to be on these panels with you and to serve with you in West Michigan. So thank you so much. There's one thing I've come to learn about Bill is we share three things, really. We share just an absolute passion for the people we serve. We, we share an, a passion for West Michigan. And we also share a sense of optimism about our work and that these challenges we face are um, have an underside of opportunity. And we'll try to draw those out today as we look at the possibilities and the changes in the educational landscape. No question, some institutions will be struggling. No question, students will be struggling um, with some of the learning gaps and some of the financial gaps, uh, the recovery of our economy. But um, we see opportunity that from our learning uh, from the responsiveness that universities have had to develop during this period to, uh, to bring some of these skills into that, uh, what will be normal for us moving forward. So next slide, please. So as, as Bill mentioned, we are going to do this a little differently. We thought we would sort of tag into the same presentation rather than one of us give a full articulation and then the other one to follow. So let, let's talk about the changes in the education and learning model. And, uh, you know, the first thing I think about, and we heard it from our two speakers, is that students responded differently to the move to um, remote education. Some um, had limited access, some had limited resonance with the delivery method, and some didn't have the developed learned strategies um, for success. At, at Grand Valley, one of the things we tried to do as we lowered our density and maintained a level of face-to-face -face instruction through the pandemic was to offer students choice and families choice. Um, we offered them choices in terms of um, whether they wanted to be fully online, whether they um, felt they needed to be face-to-face -face in some segment of their curriculum, or whether they um, chose a, a more of a blended or hybrid model. And I don't see that flexibility going away in the future. It will be hard if you think, situate our, yourself in a student who's gone through this year, they're in next year, we're back to, to full force, you know, face-to-face -face education. And um, the student has a family issue that emerges and they need to, in this case, perhaps return to the other side of the state in order to deal with responsibilities at home. What would happen typically in higher education if they left for a, 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 a extended period of time is that we would recommend a leave of absence. We may um, you know, be sure that their work counted towards future work. So, um, but now 
that won't seem very logical anymore because we've had the capability, whether it was a student that had to isolate um, during COVID, to be able to respond differently within the same classrooms to online and face-to-face -face instruction. So I think that flexibility will be expected and needs to be built into our, our thinking moving forward. I really, um, I, I, I hearken back to my beginning and I came to Grand Valley with um, a focus on being sure that, that education, which needs to be for a lifetime because of the pace of change, was positioned well to support not only traditional learners, but adult learners. And the conversations that we had around um, digital education were participants had a mix of never having experienced it or having experienced it deeply. And now everyone's had an experience with remote or digital education. So we can move forward in what works best in learning um, if we take what we've learned and the experience into the new instruction. We also can't leave behind the face-to-face -face opportunity. It, to me, it would be such a waste for us to go back to pushing information from a lecture style into a classroom mode um, when we know how precious the interactions are, how precious the experience, connection with one another, the ability to dialogue, debate, or have something absolutely unexpected happen. So um, these opportunities will make of mixed modalities, um, new forms of curricula, uh, new forms of flexibility, I think can all be brought into the future. So Bill, I'm gonna ask you to add into this one. Yeah, and Philly, I appreciate what you just said about uh, a waste. Um, that it would, it, I, I fully agree, it would totally be, um, and I, I even would say it'd be a shame for us if uh, what we are thinking uh, in higher education, uh, you know, we make that statement, you know, and I remember I've heard the statement the last 11 months, and I know you have too, Philly, that statement of, oh, I can't wait to get back to normal. Well, uh, friends, um, I, I got to tell you, I don't, I don't think normal of a year ago today was the best thing. I think what we have learned these last 11, 12 months is that there are some things that uh, this pandemic, alongside what we call the other pandemic of what we saw around our, uh, our the, the glaring reminder of the racial and social uh, issues that we still have uh, in this country, I think when we look at those things and how those two things, those two pandemics, if you will, have exposed so many inequities um, in our in our uh, communities, uh, shame on us in higher ed if we feel like that we just need need to get back to exactly what we were before. Um, we've got to make sure we're learning the lessons. What's interesting when I think about a year ago this month, so last academic year is interesting for us here at GRCC because that school year, so that was the, the winter semester of, uh, of, that, of 1920. When we started the school year, my theme that I pushed on camp to campus uh, in my opening and where we were going this year, that school year, we were looking at disruption. And we were talking about how we as the community college, how instead of being disrupted, how can we as the community college become the disruptor? And so we were really diving into that kind of all those type of, of conversations. And then we get, again, a level of disruption that we just that none of us saw coming. And so then the question became, how do you adjust to the disruption into Philly's points? This idea of our education and learning model in terms of what we would need to do as in this case, as a community college. How did we? Uh, how did we have to uh, respond? And what were the? What was the response in terms of truly continuing to serve our students and serve our community in the midst of the mystery of the pandemic? I know uh, many people that were like us that I remember walking off campus um, last March, late March, when the governor shut us all down, uh, when we said, you know what, we got shut down, rethink uh, what's going on right now. I remember uh, walking out of this very building and saying to my team, well, hopefully this will be a couple of weeks, two, three weeks, and we'll be back on campus and we'll be able to get things up and running again. 
Boy, you saw how that one worked. So um, now here we sit 11, 12 months later. And again, the idea in higher education of making sure that we are able to make the shift, make the shift in terms of what those learning models look like and continue to shift as we go down post pandemic. Because again, the question becomes, are we truly doing the most we can and the best we can to serve our community and meet them rather than asking them to come and meet us? Here's how we do it, you come to, no, how do you need it? And so what we uh, saw across the country is modalities here on our campus. We have, we have been in four different modalities these last uh, two semesters ending this year and we'll continue them, I'll tell you, at some levels. But those modalities really around still having some face-to-face -face instruction, that's important to us because we know many of our students need that. But also having what we just call online, the traditional online classes that we have uh, uh, vetted for years uh, here on our campus. Also what we call virtual. Our virtual, what we call virtual is what we're doing right now. A virtual class that meets just like a face-to-face -face class in terms of time and everything, but here's how it meets. And then the last uh, modality is a, what we call our hybrid, where it's a combination of virtual and in-person. And all of those four modalities, that's how we're built right now. And I think we will continue to have that sort of uh, framework going forward to make sure we are serving our students. We hear from our students who are online. Many of them will tell us, thank you, because this is allowing me the flexibility I need to continue to get my education, my higher ed uh, uh, work done. And we also hear from our students who, who uh, want to be face to face, those who are face to face saying thank you, and those who aren't on our campus, who did not come to school because they said, you know what, that's the modality I need. I need face to face. I'm just going to wait this one out. And so we hear from them as well. And we want to make sure that as we dig out of this, that we are moving toward getting, uh, giving those students the relevant information, the relevant modality that they need. And that's going to be important because coming into this, uh, as we said back in March of last year, there was a there was no playbook on this campus that said, oh, here's how you handle a pandemic if it happens. We didn't have that playbook. Now that we have that playbook, it will be can be used even in uh, whether it be uh, uh, any kind of, of issue uh, that shuts us down in any way. We've got uh, a little bit better in terms of what that means. Go to the next slide if you would, because I want to transition us to talking more about workforce readiness or work readiness. And uh, uh, Philly, I know that you hear it as well. Many companies and uh, many people talk about, you know, that very thing of how many jobs are not coming back um, after, after this pandemic is over. If you saw last week's, uh, last week there was a Washington Post article that was entitled really that, you know, millions of jobs, I think the title, millions of jobs will not return uh, after the pandemic is over. Now, and here's what that means, right? And so what that article talked about, and I encourage you to look it up because it was interesting in several ways. Number one, it talked about how it said 20% of business, of business travel will go, that has gone away, 20% of that at least will not return. That after, that after this pandemic is over with, because of how much remote work is done and how many jobs have been lost, some of that business travel that we used to be so, uh, that used to be so relied upon of other industries, a lot of that is not going to come back. It talked about also, it had a, a mention of two thirds. It said two thirds of people who are jobless right now, two thirds of that population are seriously actively pursuing a change as far as their careers are concerned. So what does that mean for higher education? Oh my goodness, huge implications for us, for Grand Valley, for all of our higher ed partners, when those people are saying, I need to make a change. So our relevance is that much more important in terms of how we're going to serve those populations to make sure we're doing all we can to stay relevant. And that to me is the most important thing. We've got to stay relevant. I know when we have conversations with some of our uh, industry partners and we ask them, you know, what do you need? You know, how, how has your industry changed? How has your sector changed? Most of them say, yes, it's gonna, it's changing, it's changing, it's gonna be different. Well, how is it? And some of our company partners, some of them know here's what's happening, but others are saying, you know what? I'm not sure what it's gonna look like. I know it's not gonna look the way it did, but I'm not sure what it's gonna look like. So that means that higher education, we have to be that close partner 
that help go down the road with our company and industry partners to say, how can we work with you to make some of those things happen so that you are returning back to the high, the rel the, the high level of productivity, the relevance that you had, and how can we bolster that even more even after this pandemic is over? Philly, uh, I'd be I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this. Thanks, Bill. I know that the, the GRCC has always had um, surrounding its curriculum development, you know, the industry experts are nonprofits in partnership to be sure we're on point with our education and Grand Valley has as well. And I think that's gonna be critical because the shifts are gonna be dramatic post pandemic as Bill pointed to. One of the things that is pervasive is that we all, most every industry, move to some sort of remote, remote or digital mode for some period of time. And we all know that not only impact the delivery of whatever service or um, business we were in, but it also impacted our culture, it impacted our choices, it impacted our thinking on who could be remote and who could be in place, uh, how, we, how we evaluated performance, just about every aspect. And so digital transformation or operating in a digital and place-based environment, I think has to become among the core competencies we talk about along with critical thinking and problem solving and um, understanding diversity. It's got to become a sort of a fundamental competency that we build in for people to be work ready. Their work will change over the course of their lives, and I think it'll be really important that they're able to make the shifts um, as the workplace um, work landscape changes. I'd like to just offer one um, publication that I really found useful, and it just came out at the end of February 2021, and it's called After the Storm, The Jobs and Skills That Will Drive the Post-Pandemic recovery. And it was done by Burning Glass, um, really examining the labor market data, um, the job um, postings nationally that are up. And I really liked the way they characterize what we've got to be thinking about, which will be a doubling of the workforce need in five major areas. And I just want to give them to you quickly. One is the readiness economy. And um, healthcare workers were a part of the readiness economy, right? We learned that without a doubt this year. Cybersecurity, insurance, any of the fields that really deal with resilience and agility. The logistics economy, we know and understand that, right? We had to get our supply chains moving in new and different ways. The green economy, the remote economy, and the automated economy. Today, that makes up 8% of our workforce. And within the next five years, it's projected that that'll make up 16% of our workforce, a dramatic shift. And so colleges and universities, as we're thinking about undergirding students' capabilities and competencies with the kind of skills that they'll need over a lifetime, we've got to be sure that we're opening up opportunities across our degree programs in these new areas so that students' curricula will be immediately relevant and be immediately important. Bill and I and our institutions both share that we see our roles as educating individuals and building our economy in West Michigan. And so in order to do that, we're gonna to have to look at these key skills areas. Next slide, please. I know that Bill and I are having are absolutely struggling not jumping in on each other after we talk because we like to do that, but this is, we take off all the Q&A time, so. Um, Bill touched on this, as did our, our, um, our two speakers ahead of time uh, before us, which is the disproportionate effect on students of color, first generation students, students with special needs, students who didn't um, adjust to the, um, the delivery of remote education or didn't have access to it. A recent study came out that learning that a, a three month gap, and we used to look at summer, right? and what students lose in learning over a summer period before they come back to the next fall. Three months of the disruption we've had can equal as much as a year's loss in learning. And one of the things that Grand Valley announced just this last week, on last Friday of last week, was that we'll take a program that grew out of our brilliant faculty and staff volunteering to do the right thing for 
um, for supporting our community and creating a tutoring an infrastructure for digital tutoring. And we're gonna create that into the K-12 Connect as an ongoing partnership because we also know these learning gaps aren't gonna come and go with just a little more scaffolding and support into the next year. So we really, if we're concerned about equity, we've got to double down on these approaches. We can't say these students, you know, higher eds, uh, particularly I came out of a, uh, an institution that was more in the selective institution categories um, and didn't have as wide a breadth of student backgrounds. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an, it's a, an industry that values exclusion, if you think about it, right? Our, we only select 20% of our applicants that apply. Not many industries say something like that. They usually want all the applicants that apply to, to take on board what they have to offer. So we, if we're concerned about equity, not only do we need to open up our thinking around how we've evaluated students' readiness for school, but we've got to put some scaffolding in place, acknowledging this tremendous year of disruption. So Bill? So true. Um, I, I don't know if any of you and, and saw yesterday. So yesterday is Grand, uh, Grand Rapids Business Journal. There was an article in there, uh, the digital version. There's an article in there that is talking about looking at data here in Grand Rapids on home ownership. And the article really focuses on how uh, some of the disparities as far as those percentages of home ownership when it comes to uh, some of our various ethnicities in Grand Rapids. So it looked at uh, those uh, uh, black and brown uh, populations in Grand Rapids and that percentage of home ownership, because friends, that truly is one of, one of the metrics that we consider when we start figuring uh, what our uh, what inequities, what disparities, what what are the gaps in our community? And Grand Rapids, honestly, as much as we rank really high on some really cool lists uh, of nationally, best place to do this, best place to do that, friends, that data did not look so well. Um, as far as saying from our minority population, our our people of color population in Grand Rapids, where that's at about thirty seven point seven percent as far as home ownership is concerned. And again, using that as a metric to also make some other inferences. Um, the high end was uh, Elk Grove, California. They are at 72%, a little over 72%. The low end, uh, the lowest on the, that list that was uh, in there listed on uh, or pointed out in that article was Newark, New Jersey. They're at about 21%. So the low end was about 21%. Uh, the highest end uh, on that uh, on that deep dive was 72%. Grand Rapids were about 37%. What it talks about is, again, it helps us understand better what this uh, picture is right here locally. And so with what Philly was just talking about is so important in terms of understanding also how that bleeds over into what the education experience looks like for our students here in Grand Rapids, especially if they are living in areas where their school district or their school or their specific location, K-12, when March hit last year, what kind of a shift they were able to make and what shifts are still being made. What we do know is as, uh, as, as my colleagues earlier today mentioned, that idea of the importance of that in-face instruction uh, to many of these uh, K-12 students, uh, for many of them, that became a gap in terms of uh, that, uh, that opportunity. Uh, access, we've got to really make sure we understand the word access because we think about access is, well, you know what, we had to go for virtual. So access is, let me just put a laptop in the hands of that uh, student and a hotspot. That's helpful, that's digital access. But does access truly mean that you have uh, a, a, a piece of equipment or does access mean that you have access to be successful? And access to success really says, are the other pieces there in place uh, to help them uh, truly have access to success? And so from a standpoint of what we're looking at in higher education, understanding that it's so important for us to be connecting to each other and to our partners um, in, in, in thinking about how do we help each other, whether it be our K-12 partners, our four-year partners, our two-year partners, We've got to think, and you can go to the next slide on that because that next slide really talks about, you see that word partnership. You see how we talk about 
some of the models, uh, the organizational models, if you will. And that second, that second bullet is, um, you know, I lived by the second bullet pre-pandemic. I certainly live by it now. Partnerships are important to us. So that partnership in trying to address those inequities that we just talked about, the partnerships that we engage in are going to be vital. I feel it's vital that we have strong partnerships with our K-12 partners to dig at some of those issues that we can help at in, in terms of how those students matriculate to the community college in this case. And it's important that opportunities like what we're on right now, where the, the local community college in this area partners with our four-year partner in Grand Valley State in talking about what healthcare education can look like and the partnership that we share these, my friends, are going to be more important than ever in my career, that these type of partnerships, because this truly, I believe this pathway is a truly, I think transfer and transfer pathways, I call that an equity issue. I think that's about equity. I think it's about how some of our students who may be first generation and other, other issues that they are challenges that they and barriers that they have to overcome. I think if we uh, do not have these strong transfer pathways clearly laid out, clearly articulated. Now we've just put another barrier in their way. And so how do we make sure? And that's one of the nice things I love about the partnership that we enjoy with Grand Valley. It's one of the things I love about the partnership and friendship I have with Philly is that it's about how we can work together to make sure that our students, that this community in West Michigan has the best opportunity at not just higher education, but equality higher education. And so the three things that I would leave this point, I wanna, wanna give it to, to Philly to talk about this slide, but the three can'ts of this slide, the three things that I say we can't do. The first thing is that we, I can't stress the need for partnerships as we dig out of this pandemic. That's the first can't. The second can't, we can't be afraid, as you see on the slide, we cannot be afraid to adapt or to even in some cases totally shift to make sure we are being responsive to our students. And the third thing, we can't go back to what we called normal prior to this pandemic. Those three can'ts I think are so important in terms of what we've got to think about in moving our community forward. Philly, love to hear your thoughts on that. So I'm gonna stay with your theme of can'ts, Bill, and um, just add a few more. And uh, you know, the first what is that we can't think about education is one and done. We've got to think about opening up opportunities. And that means reconsidering our business model. You know, our business model in universities and colleges is students, you know, put their resources, do perhaps some borrowing, get a college education, last them for life. That's not a model that can be sustained anymore. So we've got to think about models that will allow students to come back to their institutions to be supported over a lifetime, for education to be crossing over as Bill and I believe with our institutions, um, each other in these kinds of partnerships that he's discussed, but with K-12 as well and with industry, um, supporting the, the adults that need to be upskilled and, and reskilled in the shifting economy that we talked about. So I think that's a really um, important can't as well. And the other can't is as we're struggling through this, um, this uh, crisis it, it, within our institutions, we can't limit ourselves to just making the operations run, right? We all have financial pressures and every day, you know, I think about wanting to restore X, Y, and Z, but we've got to make the space for innovation um, I think it's interesting the way institutions will make the space for deferred maintenance. We understand that you can't let a building build it and just let it fall to crumble 30 years later. Well, intellectual activity is exactly the same thing. We have to make the space for innovation and we have to support some funds to try some new things, um, to support our faculty and staff who wanna break out of the box and say, I really see a way to do this differently in an early middle college program or working with a community college or working across our shared assets. And I'm gonna add one more can't is we can't compete uh, to the public detriment. So higher education is a competitive industry. Demographics are going down. People are worried about their institutions surviving. And sometimes that means we do things to preserve our flow 
student flow. And we can't do that. We've got to open up our systems and open up our supports, open up our learning um, management systems where we can, the assets we've created digitally to others, um, because that's in the public interest and we're all public institutions uh, in service to our community. So we'll just put up the last slide because I think we've used our time and uh, Bill, this is your quote. So I'm gonna let you have the first word and the last word because you have longevity on me, my friend. <laughs> you, oh, Philly, you are so good. Um, I, Philly and I, when we were making this, uh, when she, we've seen laying these slides and uh, there was a quote that you see on the screen that, um, that a friend of, of both of ours, uh, Birgit, Birgit Close, uh, just a former CEO of the right place, uh, that I was on a call with her and she threw this quote out there and it just struck me. I was standing right here uh, on that presentation. And I immediately wrote it down and uh, shared it with our campus, uh, with one of our campus groups about a week or so ago. And uh, Philly and I, as we were talking about this presentation, I threw this one out there and she said, yeah, we need to have that. Um, from uh, retired U.S. Army General Eric Shinseski. If you don't like change, you will like irrelevance even less. Two words that I talk about at GRCC that people probably have gotten tired of these last four years is uh, the word relevant and the word responsive. Are we as a college relevant and responsive to our community, to our students, and to each other? And when I saw this quote that said, if you don't like uh, change, you're going to like irrelevance much, uh, much less. That's where we are, friends. Um, we've got to understand that the shift that has to happen and continues to happen uh, is one that we not only should feel what the embrace needs to look like, but how do we in the midst of embracing, how do we ourselves shift to make sure that we are truly relevant and responsive to our students, to our community and to our each other. Because if we can't be comfortable with that, we're gonna like and can't be comfortable with change, I assure you, we will like, dislike irrelevance a whole lot, a whole <laughs> lot more than we dislike change. So uh, thank you guys for this and looking forward to questions today. Thank you very much, Dr. Pink, Dr. Mantella. Definitely appreciate your insights uh, and your passion. I, I think that's uh, very relevant. I, I'm gonna ask the, the four expert panelists if you could rejoin us. Um, with your video, and that'd be, that'd be great. So we get a chance to go through some of the questions and answers. I know we have just a few minutes here, a lot of questions and answers. Um, I think we have a lot of questions. We'll see how the answers roll out. I'm gonna start uh, maybe uh, with Elizabeth and Sheila. Um, I'm gonna try to put a couple of these questions together and ask, uh, Elizabeth, you had mentioned something about uh, the components of funding uh, when it comes to a lot of the Title I uh, formula for funding of schools. I think Sheila, you mentioned a little bit about the funding. Um, with all the COVID expenses that are that we have with PPE um, that are um, really not pertinent towards just Title I, but to all students, uh, masks, shields, cleaning, uh, staffing, those type of things. How do you envision some of the learning loss that may have taken place um, to be funded if the, the money is only uh, allocated primarily based on title funds. I'll turn over to Elizabeth maybe to start and maybe Sheila, if you wanna jump in, that'd be great, or either one can start, sorry about that. I'll defer to Sheila on this one. She, oh. she knows more about education funding than I do for sure. Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks Elizabeth. Um, so Doug, uh, the ESSER funds are being allocated, well, 90% of the ESSER funds are being allocated through Title I um, uh, uh, allocations or through Title I um, uh, funding formula. But the other 10% um, will be coming to um, schools and districts and those funds can be spent um, absolutely to support learning loss as well as for um, PPE, as well as for any facility upgrades that are needed, such as improving the airflow quality or flushing the water systems. Um, so there's a great deal. There's, there's a tremendous amount of flexibility that's available with the ESSER 1 funds, as well as the ESSER 2 funds. Um, so we think about both pots of money, the ESSER 1 funds that came earlier this year, and then the ESSER 2 funds that are being allocated most recently. Thank you. 
Uh, there's a quick comment here uh, to Director Hertel. Thank you for moving caregivers of at-risk kids up the priority list for vaccination. Uh, definitely a lot of people appreciate the work that, uh, that you and your department are doing. There is a question here regarding, uh, we have K-12 educators uh, that, have, that are on the vaccine list and have been moved up the vaccine list or were on the vaccine list. A lot of them have been vaccinated. I can tell you in our school district, we're close to 94% of our staff have been vaccinated that uh, chose to be vaccinated. What are your thoughts about moving potentially um, higher ed staff uh, faculty um, into that group to get vaccinated sooner? Or is that uh, on the plan or what is the likelihood? We are trying to move um, those higher risk populations up as quickly as possible. We are expanding the priority groups available for vaccinations based on the quantities that we have coming in. So we we're trying to be cautious about op opening up too much uh, and creating uh, more of a um, uh, jam in scheduling than what we have now. However, uh, I'm very optimistic that by the end of this month, we will start seeing significantly more vaccines coming into uh, this state and, and uh, around the country, and that we'll be able to expand fairly broadly at that point. That's great. It's very encouraging. I know it's, uh, like I said, it's, uh, it's just the light at the end of the tunnel is getting brighter, which is a great thing. I'm going to uh, ask Sheila, you made a, a comment regarding uh, increasing the number of days of instruction. Uh, what is the thought regarding days of instruction versus hours of instruction? I know there's there maybe not everybody on this, uh, not only uh, the, the attendees, looking at the differences between days of instruction and hours of instruction. Can you talk a little bit about the increased need for uh, student contact time? Um, absolutely. Thanks, Doug. The uh, state requirement right now is for 180 days of instruction um, or um, 1,098 hours of instruction. Actually, it's and. So um, what we're recommending is that rather than increasing the number of hours, that we look at increasing the number of days because by adding days to the calendar, so if you add um, a week of instruction, um, you're adding um, typically 30 hours of instruction to the school calendar, which will give you um, an opportunity to do more in-depth learning with students because you've got five days versus if we added 30 hours and spread those 30 hours over the existing 180 days, then you get a short um, additional amount of learning time each day. You get more powerful or, or more, uh, you, more time spent with intense learning if you are doing it on a full day of instruction versus uh, an, on an hourly basis. Perfect. And that, you know, obviously it, uh, for, especially the little ones, uh, the elementary students and getting into middle school, that, that extra time and days of instruction is very important. Uh, not only for their, as they go through and, and most of them learning how to read when they're really little, uh, it's just very important to get them in. And, spend and if I can just piggyback on that for a minute, Doug, when you think about our, our little one, our elementary age children, um, adding more time to their day, they're tired at the end of the day. They're ready to go home. They want to go home. They want to have a snack. Um, th they don't want to have a, a longer school day. And I, I guess I would say the same thing would be true for middle school and high school students as well. And maybe, and maybe uh, some of us also, I'm not going to lie. Uh, sometimes you get sure. to the end of the day, a good snack would be all right and <laughs> jump on the couch. So uh, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Pink and Dr. Mantella uh, just a, a, a real quick as you as you navigate this evolving change um, in the educational process. You have students that now you can reach outside of the region. Uh, it's no longer just students that are living near Allendale or living near Grand Rapids. You you can now reach out to a larger base of students, and you have international students. How would you say the the pandemic uh, and definitely the the shift in the educational um, systems or delivery is impacting students outside of our immediate region and maybe in particular the international students? So um, I, I think with international students, we saw across the country a real closing of the pipeline of international students coming to the U.S. from both shifts in immigration uh, requirements and uh, shifts in, um, you know, then the COVID hit and there was travel bans and restrictions that kept 
uh, the students from being able to participate on the ground. So I think that will take a while to build back up. I think we'll see that to be a slow build back. U.S. education is really attractive in international markets. It will come back, but I think it will take some time and sustained effort to bring it back. I do think there's opportunity to, to outreach and I think institutions have to do that thoughtfully. Grand Valley has begun to do that um, with our adult degree completion in neighboring states and with our Veterans Promise where we announced that in the state of Michigan and that we would support students who wanted to serve their country first by reserving an admission slot for them. And we have had some Midwest states approach us to do that. So I think we wanna be thoughtful, but I think as you uh, point out, Doug, there's real opportunity there. I would, I would echo that. We have, we actually uh, ourselves at GRCC have a, a international student population, albeit small, yet um, we've seen the same thing as uh, what Philly mentioned and how that pipeline has really been uh, slowed uh, tremendously um, and what we, we believe that will uh, that that will slowly open up for us we also for us just access in terms of students in because of being a community our community college we really are focused more on that from a standpoint of Kent County and our surrounding counties so how is it that uh, the delivery systems that we and modalities we use now, how is it that we are making uh, ready access for those students? Um, the presence that we have in Ottawa County, that's important to us as, uh, very much so. And so how does that access look? And with uh, being uh, stronger, having stood up stronger in terms of virtual and online learning, uh, we believe it just becomes a, another vehicle for our students who are within our uh, West Michigan region to be able to access us. And as the community college, uh, this West Michigan region is our truly our primary. Thank you both. Uh, Elizabeth, I'd like to ask you a quick question regarding, uh, there's a, talks a little bit about uh, teachers being able to teach more effectively, maybe without uh, masks. Uh, in other words, using face shields as opposed to masks. We know our little learners use a lot of, um, you know, they, the facial expressions, uh, when they're, when they're really learning how to read and speak so forth. But, um, uh, what are some of the parameters maybe that will be needed to be met in order to see some of those, maybe not a complete mask uh, removal, but different uh, allowable shields and so forth so that teachers can teach a little bit different manner? That's a great question. One of the things that we've seen develop over the last year is uh, our masks that actually have a, a clear um, cut out, but are still a mask that uh, many people are using in the deaf and hard of hearing community. Um, so if there are uh, schools that need assistance in trying to uh, identify or source somewhere to find those sorts of resources, certainly reach out to me in the department and we can help to try to connect those districts to do that. That's, that is incredibly important. And Again, the amazing creativity of people over the last year to continue to communicate effectively, even with uh, mitigation strategies. So however we can be helpful, we would love to do that. That's great, thank you. I know there's a lot of creative masks. I know that the kids are creative with their masks in school. They, uh, they're they're kind of cute. As long as they're not sharing masks, that's a good thing. Um, I'm gonna ask, uh, I know this is maybe a more of a question for K-12 educa education. So Sheila, maybe you can address this. Uh, but probably a little bit in uh, post-secondary. Um, with, with, we have a lot of talk about what we're doing with kids and students and teachers and staff. Uh, what about the relationship with parents? Um, how, how are we pulling parents into this mix and this conversation? And I know most of our college students, I would say, are, are 18 years old and, and make a lot of their decisions. But uh, what do you think we're doing more with the, the work with parents into these, some of these decisions? Or is that mostly a, a local district work that's being done? So I'd be happy to take that, Doug. I would say um, that it's a local decision, but decisions that are being made at a local level should take into consideration uh, input from parents. And we know that there are many districts that are surveying their parents and asking parents what their needs are um, and how the district can meet those needs. Um, also in communication and partnership with their local health department, 
um, and in partnership um, with um, their, their staff, bringing their staff voice in as well. So hearing the voice of parents, hearing the voice of staff, and working with their health department to make decisions. Perfect. Thank you. I'm going to I'm going to ask Dr. Mantel and Dr. Dr. Pink maybe something near and dear to me is, uh, has to do with um, some athletics. So talk a little bit about uh, maybe how has the athletic uh, scene changed? I know I, I see Dr. Mantel's picture in the stands, um, but I know <laughs> she physically wants to be there. Uh, how has that changed uh, and how will it maybe change in the future? I can pass an, in the no fan rule as the uh, the coach, the assistant coach. So uh, I have shown up at a few, but um, seriously though, I, I, I do think the protocols we have established, uh, they're, they're established around testing obviously more than anything else, but, but the sort of care uh, around wellness of the student athlete and just the heightened interest. Some of that I think will play into just good care and the kind of responsibilities we have for each other's teams being um, being well and supported on the field as an athlete, as well as as a student. You know, I hope we're gonna get back to real to normal, whether we're gonna put 100,000 in, in the stands in the fall, I think that's questionable. Uh, we don't have a stands of 100,000, but I know there is some, some, you know, schools that are reporting out that fall will be back 100% to normal. But I think, you know, we'd like to see the full student athlete experience um, restored. And really, I, I would say all co-curricular life, it has just been such an important part of the college experience. And what many of us talk about when we think about our college experience. So I think the, the faster we can get back to allowing students to gather responsibly, the better we'll do with the social, emotional maturing process that happens through the collegiate years. Bill, do you want to add in? Yeah, and I'll add to that. Um, we, uh, and I think, uh, I think Philly is spot on uh, here at, the, at our college. Uh, some of that, as we have been, um, as we have been akin to at the at uh, GRCC, some of that is really steered by our national organization or our conference and regional organizations, athletic associations. Um, in that when they say, eh, no, we're not doing that right now, we say, huh, okay, we're not doing that right now. Uh, right now we have our volleyball season is going and I, our volleyball team is typically a, that's a fall sport to us. Our volleyball team is playing right now. This is their season, uh, our men's and women's basketball teams. Um, and so, which they, while this is their season, it's still not a regular season because we just, our first game was only a few weeks ago. And so um, what I believe it'll do, what we'll see uh, to answer that also, as far as trying to look into a crystal ball, I think what it'll do, and I think for all co-curricular, our theater program, I mean, we, our, our theater students, we're missing them. We're missing our productions. Um, for all of those programs, all those activities, I think what it has done is that uh, if nothing else, COVID has raised a level of responsiveness to uh, hygiene and cleanliness. So how we now think about how we in, in, uh, take care of our, our facilities, how our athletes, how we take care of them, that coming out of COVID-19, coming out of this pandemic and understanding it with variants and all the things that we're looking at uh, going forward, that I think it has raised for us. And I think us in this case is our, our society, that there are some things around cleanliness that uh, we just need to be more adhere adhering to. Um, I, uh, how many times a day do you wash your hands now compared to what you used to? Or if your hands are like mine, uh, I have to keep my lotion right here on my desk because they are dry uh, because of hand washing, hand sanitation. There you go, yeah, Philly. Um, I, I have two, I, I mean, I've got our, of course, it's a GRCC, but um, we've been, I mean, our, our hand, and so the awareness of the hygienic side of what we do, I think from an athletic and an activity standpoint, especially when you talk about getting so many people together in close proximity, I think it is it will cause us to really consider how we go about, not that we will, you know, because I do want to, I mean, I want us to get back to where we're, we have uh, plenty of people in our stands and in our uh, theater watching our students uh, do their do their job, do their deal, because uh, our students, they work hard at doing their deal, and I want people to watch them do their deal. They and do. So, it's, it's part of the experience. Um, exactly. I know uh, Director Hertel can, can probably speak to this, but uh, based on the cleanliness that we've 
learned to come accustomed to, it's really helped our flu rates a lot in the, uh, definitely in the state, uh, maybe even in the Northern Hemisphere, we've been gone through this. So a lot of great work. And I think you're right, it's gonna change in the future. We're running low on time. I, I, I'm gonna ask the last question and maybe a, a very, it, it needs a lot of discussion, but one last question for all of you. Can you talk just real, real briefly in, in 30 seconds about mental health supports that are available to students, parents, staff uh, that need it in your unique environments? So I'll, I'll jump in first on that um, question, Doug. Um, the Michigan Department of Education has a web page for social emotional learning. Um, and on that web page, we have um, strategies. So the web, web page is open to anyone, michigan.gov slash MDE and uh, click on uh, uh, SEL, social emotional learning. And there are strategies, there's a Q&A sheet, there are toolkits, there's online professional development. There's a wealth of information that's available on and it pertains to student mental health, but also to adults and staff mental health. Thank you. At our college, real briefly, we have uh, counselors that are here um, as part of our campus family, as far as our GRCC family. Uh, we have counselors, and uh, aside from just our academic advisors, there are counselors that we have uh, for those type of services. And we've been doing a lot of that virtually uh, during the pandemic. And also we connect them to some of our community resources because many of those community resources are good partners with us as well. I would just say ditto to uh, to what Bill has offered and also say that we've created more networks of supports, volunteers that, because the biggest issue we have is isolation. And, and so just getting people to be companions, uh, you know, we've touched base with our students, all 23,000 every uh, term uh, with people volunteering, with families. And then many of our students are volunteering with community members just to reduce isolation, um, but also expanded the mental health supports within counseling and online. Perfect. Well, I, I want to thank all of our panelists, our expert panelists. Uh, once again, I, uh, COVID-19 reminds me somewhat of a hurricane. Um, uh, we knew it was kind of coming. We didn't know if it was going to, where it was going to hit, but it ended up hitting all of us. Uh, we did a lot of boarding up and preparing, and we made a lot of changes to our lives. And and then you get to the eye of the storm where you think it's it's pretty and everything is great and we're going to be okay. But we realize there's a lot of wraparound services that we'll have to uh, provide uh, once this is done, knowing that there's a lot of cleanup and there's a lot of people out there that want to do the heavy lifting to help our kids, to help our community, uh, and to take care of each other. Uh, so I do want to thank you. I do like the quote that uh, Dr. Pink shared. I have a quote on mine that I just... Uh, it's from, I'm a big hockey fan, so Herb Brooks from the, the Miracle on Ice, he said, great moments are born from great opportunity. And I think that's what we have is an opportunity to do some great things um, for all of those in the state of Michigan that all of us are working hard to take care of. So I do wanna thank all of our panelists. I wanna thank all of our attendees for spending some time with us on this beautiful Friday morning. This does conclude the series uh, on COVID-19. While this is the last forum of West Michigan for this semester, we still have one more event that is part of the Health Forum for Northern Michigan series. That event will be held on March 18, 2021 via Zoom webinar, again from 8 to 9.30. The title will be Protecting Our Mental Health. Very important. And we'll focus on mental health care delivery in rural areas. So please watch your email this afternoon for more information on this event. We hope to see you then. Please take care of yourself, take care of those around you, and have an amazing weekend. Thanks again.